Well, actually, I tried. I asked Patty out when we were making the film, and she said no, <laughs> which is very embarrassing at the time. <clears throat> but it all worked out right in the end. Except it didn't. What does Something by The Beatles, penned by George Harrison, and Eric Clapton's Layla have in common? Despite both being among the most successful tracks by their respective artists, they're also songs written about the same person. A woman who'd find herself in the middle of an incredibly complicated love triangle, one that would cause multiple heartbreaks for everyone involved. But perhaps more importantly, would also cause some of the most poignant love songs ever to be recorded. Hi, I'm Adam, welcome back to Music Mongoose. So, no points for guessing who the mystery woman is, it was Patty Boyd, a model. Here she is looking very modelly in the 60s. As well as the aforementioned songs, Patty would also inspire For You Blue and I Need You from the Beatles, as well as Clapton's songs Bell Bottom Blues and Wonderful Tonight. The difference between these songs is that in George Harrison's case, these songs were written about the love he had for his wife. In Eric Clapton's case, his songs were written about the love he had for his best friend's wife. Awkward. Although of course George and Patty would divorce and Eric and Patty would later marry, there's a lot of details in that rocky period that shed light on the music that was produced, including the most famous track of all, Layla. Shall we? 1964. The Beatles are filming their film A Hard Day's Night, the Fab Four's big screen debut. Patty Boyd was hired to play the role of Jean, a blonde schoolgirl who they meet on the train they use to flee a horde of fans right before meeting Paul's mischievous, troublemaking grandfather. Yeah, the plot is ridiculous, but it's where George and Patty would meet for the very first time. She was already with someone at that time, though, photographer Eric Swain. But no bother, she promptly dumped Swain in favour of the Beatle, and the pair were married in 1966, just a couple of years after meeting. This, of course, happened to be the year that the Beatles packed in the touring shtick and became a recording group only. This decision did wonders for George and Patty's relationship. They could spend much more time together, and if anything, fell deeper in love. They both shared a passion for not eating animals as well. Let's rewind again to 1964 the year Patty and George met, because it was also the same year that George Harrison and Eric Clapton met. The Yardbirds were invited to support the Beatles at a Christmas show of theirs in London. George and Eric hit it off and became best buds, probably over their mutual obsession with guitars. Now, there was a weird paradox happening with their relationship at this point. The Yardbirds were relatively unknown compared to the Beatles, but Eric Clapton was a well-known and admired guitarist and blues musician in industry circles. George Harrison, on the other hand, was hugely successful because he was in the Beatles. However, he longed for having that respect and admiration as a guitar player, just like Eric. So with that, their relationship started to blossom. George respected Eric so much as both a friend and a guitar player that he actually invited him to play on While My Guitar Gently Weeps, a Beatles classic at Abbey Road Studios. This was one of many collaborations Eric and George would produce in 1968 and 1969, including Cream's Badge. George would use these collaborations as a bit of a distraction from the Beatles, and also as a way into that guitar world that Eric inhabited. Around the same time, George was writing songs for the Beatles, like Here Comes the Sun and Something, like we mentioned earlier, proving himself as a serious musician, not just a member of the Fab Four. In the late 60s and early 70s, George was done with the Beatles and was looking for the next thing. Clapton was in a similar position. Throughout the 60s, he had played in the Yardbirds, the Blues Breakers, and formed Cream in 1966, where he found a couple of years of respectable mainstream success. After Cream, there was Blind Faith, and after that, he was also considering what to do next. And this is how the foundation of Eric falling for Patty was put into place. Eric and George's idea of what to do next differed wildly. George became more distant from Patty, and Eric would find himself in a situation where he could get closer to her. George, inspired by his time in India with the Beatles, wanted to delve further into spirituality, and wanted to emulate the god Krishna, surrounded by young women, which would of course damage his relationship with Patty. Patty would describe this behaviour change like this. He wanted to spread his wings and take advantage of being the handsome, famous, rich guy that he was, and see how the girls feel about him. Eric, on the other hand, bought a house in Surrey and was ready for the quiet life. Hurtwood Edge would become his solitude. Here, he'd focus on music and discovered J.J. Cale, 
who would become a massive influence. Soon, Clapton would form Derek and the Dominoes, the group that would of course later release the track Layla. During this time, despite George plunging himself into spirituality, Eric, George and Patty would see a lot of each other. Eric's house, Hurtwood Edge, was only 30 minutes up the road from where George and Patty lived. They would visit each other, have dinner, you know, the normal best friend kind of stuff. It was during this time, though, that Eric would form an affection for Patty, who was very much still George's wife, by the way. With George becoming increasingly distant in his marriage to Patty, Patty and Eric naturally became closer. The pair would embark on a secret rendezvous or two to see each other, and on one occasion, he decided to show Patty the latest song he'd been working on. The song was about a man who falls in love with an unavailable woman. Pretty on the nose there, Eric. Later, reflecting on hearing the song for the first time, Patty said this. And when I heard it, I felt that he was, I was being pushed into leaving George and being with him. And I felt, I wasn't sure how I felt about it. The song was written by Clapton and Jim Gordon, the drummer for Derek and the Dominoes. It appeared on their album Layla and other assorted love songs. This would be their only studio album. The song was actually inspired by an Arabian love story that Clapton had read from the 7th century. The story of Layla and Manjun, the tale of a young man who falls helplessly in love with a beautiful young girl before going so crazy he could never marry her. Eric, of course, adapted this story, making Patty the subject matter. The album didn't perform well. In fact, it never even reached the charts possibly because people simply didn't know it was an Eric Clapton project. He kept his name pretty well hidden on the back cover. It wasn't until the single was edited and re-released in 1972 that it actually gained some popularity, but of course by then Derek and the Dominoes had broken up. In 1992, Eric released the song again for his Unplugged album, this time with his name alongside it. This became his best-selling album, with around 26 million copies shifted. And Layla won a Grammy for Best Rock Song, but it was not really a rock song, is it? It's an acoustic song, but we won't get into that now. Now, rewinding back to when Eric showed Patty the song for the first time, later that same day, it all went down. Patty, Eric and George were all in attendance at a party in London. It was there that Clapton would come clean to Harrison. I have to tell you, man, that I'm in love with your wife. George gave Patty an ultimatum. Are you coming home with me, or are you going home with Eric? She chose George. But this whole event caused George and Patty to grow even more distant, while Clapton descended into isolation. He wouldn't see Patty again for nearly three years. At this time, Derek and the Dominoes broke up, and the early 70s saw his drinking and drug use increase. In 1974, he was able to get clean from the drugs, but his drinking became even more problematic. On the other side of things, George released All Things Must Pass and his number one album, Living in the Material World, during this time. His marriage with Patty, however, continued to decline. It arguably hit its lowest point when Harrison had an affair with Ringo Starr's wife, Maureen. This would end the relationship altogether. In the meantime, Eric and Patty had started talking again and Eric went on tour in the mid-70s and invited Patty along, and she agreed. But unfortunately, Eric would essentially drag Patty into the touring lifestyle, partying all day, copious amounts of drinks and the rest of it. This was a low point for Eric, and he dragged Patty along with him. Back from tour, Eric was seeing Patty more and more, but also sadly drinking more and more. And despite waiting eight or nine years to finally be with Patty, he was squandering the opportunity. In fact, Eric would ban Patty altogether from joining him on his tours. At this point, she had divorced George in 1977, but for her it must have felt like history was just repeating itself. Once again, she found herself in a situation where her partner was growing more and more distant because of their lifestyle. She decided to take solace in America, spending time with friends and family, and it was there when she got a phone call from Eric Clapton. He asked her to marry him. She said yes and the following Friday, the wedding took place, and George Harrison was in attendance too. In fact, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr joined as well. They even jammed on the marquee stage together. And this was, funnily enough, probably the last chance that the Beatles would have had to all play together as a four. However, unfortunately, because of a mix-up with the invitations, John Lennon never received one. I actually made a video just about this. You can click the card up there to watch it. 
Now, you might think this was a very romantic gesture for Clapton to do, wringing Patty out of the blue and asking for her hand in marriage. However, turns out it's much more degrading than that. You see, Eric made a bet with a friend of his, Roger Forrester, that he could get his name in the papers the next morning. So Eric decided the news of his marriage to Patty would probably do the trick, and lo and behold, his names were in the paper the following day. Again, just goes to show how Eric Clapton was squandering this opportunity to be with Patty, the woman he was after for so long, the woman he wrote some of the most poignant, powerful love songs about. Their marriage lasted for about 10 years, before Clapton met Loredana del Santo in Italy. He'd write the song Lady of Verona about her. Confessing his intimacy with another woman and subsequent pregnancy, Boyd and Clapton ended things, breaking Patty's heart once again. Clapton had a child with Del Santo, Connor, who tragically passed away at age four. Despite what happened in this cruel love triangle, George and Eric managed to maintain a healthy relationship, and the two did the same with Patty as well. In fact, looking back at the divorce, Patty jokingly asked for royalties to Layla, to which Eric responded, you must be kidding. Patty had sadly just been passed around by the two, becoming an inconvenience when she no longer served the role as Muse. This must be the cost for inspiring some of the most poignant love songs ever produced. And it's the music that formed the language between George and Eric, expressing how they felt through a means more effective than words. Music is a language they both speak fluently. It's a special bond between them. Perhaps this shared ability and understanding is the reason they were able to maintain their friendship. And it's the very reason that George became enamored with Eric in the very beginning. Admiration and respect for his guitar playing skills. In 2015, Patty thankfully managed to find an actual grown-up to marry, real estate developer Rod Weston. And by the looks of things, they seem happy and healthy to this day. Now, during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, another pair of hugely successful musicians had their friendship put to the test. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. In fact, the feud almost ended the Rolling Stones altogether. You can click the video there to watch that next.